upper left. Yep. Okay. Okay. Well, welcome everybody to the um, first COVID meeting of uh, the, the um, Santa Barbara Astronomical Unit. Um, we've been off the air for about two years, just about exactly right. two years. We were sitting around and judge for yourself at Friday and we started talking about maybe this pandemic thing applies to us not meeting like this. And so we <laughs> went on hiatus and now we're trying to get back with uh, Zoom. So um, we're hoping that this can grow into a, a large 80 person meeting as they do at uh, Ferrand Hall and maybe one day get back to Ferrand Hall. So I'm going to turn it over now to Chuck, who has some announcements to make. Okay, um, quick and dirty, just for outreach uh, cases. Um, oh, made her appear <laughs> right next to you. She came out of nowhere. You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> um, we've been doing some away? outreach. We're thinking about starting up again with the public star parties in, in March. So second Saturday and also the third Friday at Westmont. So uh, stay tuned, we'll see. It all depends, of course, on COVID, but it's looking reasonably good. And also, I've had a lot of trouble with my um, email list for people who are on the outreachy list. And so if you uh, would like to get onto the outreachy email list, uh, or you wanna get off of the outreachy email list, uh, please send me an email either at macpuzzle, M-A-C-P-U-Z-L at west.net or outreach at sbau.org. And uh, we'll make sure we've got the list up to date and current. So that's what I have to say. Thanks. Back to you, Jerry. Okay. And <clears throat> now we'll turn it, we're not having a planetarium meeting tonight, so we will turn it over directly to the vice president for the speakers. Just like that? So Just much like to that. So much to recap, so much to talk about. I'm going to plug our show on Mondays, guys. <clears throat> if any of you folks, members, are not aware that you love the space news that's going on around us all week long, all the time, rocket launchings and science discoveries, you are invited, urged to join us because we've got show number 50 coming up on Monday morning, 11 a.m. It's called the SBAU Astro Hour. And among other things, we have a lot of science humor with uh, Jerry's forwarded cartoons. I can guarantee you're going to have one with uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson in it. That's coming Monday. It'll be our 50th. And we're incidentally a month from tonight, exactly four weeks. If we have our second on-screen meeting, our speaker will be a young lady about to get her doctorate down at UCLA. She spoke to us before. In fact, one of our last speakers before the pandemic hit in the fall of 20, I guess, 20 or maybe it was 19, and her name is Briley Lynn Lewis. She called us, wanted to come on. Tonight, we got some speakers. We also got Mrs. Forgy there. That's uh, Jerry's better half, joining us on the bottom of the screen, wave at her. And um, the McPartlands are taking that magic act on the road. <laughs> at least on my screen, they're disappearing due to a green screen. Let's look at our speakers. Each person has between uh, oh, 15, 20 minutes. And uh, we're going to be uh, hearing from an incredible young man here in town going for his doctorate out at the university, UCSB at the end. Uh, unless Jerry juggles things around, Jerry, I'm going to feature. But we need an update on the girls club that um, Chrissy Cook came and talked to us about. Chrissy's on the screen and with us. And she had come forward, I guess, with a Girl Scout that day. And Mm -hmm. Another lady, you wanted to start a kids club of astronomy. How is that going? And you've got the, the floor, Chrissy Cook. Well, thank you so much, Ron and everybody. Great to see you. Uh, I'm Chrissy, a longtime AU member. And uh, extremely recently, I'm now the astronomy programs coordinator at the museum. So I'm the new Javier slash old Chrissy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was Javier before Javier was Javier. So I'm back in the saddle at the museum. So I guess I have a lot to update everybody on. I did put together a quick little presentation. So let me share my screen. Ooh. Let's see. There we go. The last time, and we're all seeing a picture of my adorable baby child and me, I hope. Yes? Yeah. Good. Uh, the last time I was the museum's astronomy person, 
it was a little bit like this with my tiny one-year-old son and me and then we moved to florida we came back in 2014 and i've been uh volunteering in the planetarium doing some outreach that little boy is now the tall one in the blue hat he's in high school he's in the engineering academy at dos pueblos and i have two daughters uh and i am as Ron mentioned, still uh, with the Girl Scout Astronomy Club, but here I am also in my new office. And this is important for anyone who needs to find the astronomy office. It is conveniently located very near the observatory. I'm over in the McVeigh building, that gorgeous old rundown house right behind the observatory, uh, in the office that shares the wall with the volunteer sign-in computer, if you know where that is. It used to be the Museum League office. That's where I am. That's the, that's the new hidey hole for astronomy. Uh, Charlotte's been there for a while. She has moved back over to a different office. So I am now in that office. Uh, let's see, Girl Scout Astronomy Club. Where'd that picture go? I thought I had them in there. Okay, never mind. Uh, Girl Scout Astronomy Club, still definitely a thing. They've been going strong. Uh, the Girl Scouts approached me in the winter, the early, early 2019 to ask if I'd be willing to work with a Girl Scout Astronomy Club they were trying to form that NASA was gonna sponsor and train. And of course I was more than happy to jump in and help out. So myself and two young ladies who are now juniors in high school, Skylar and Annika, and I, we uh, were treated to a week long training at the Goddard Space Flight Center. And the girls came back super excited. Our astronomy club was going strong. We were meeting on second Saturdays uh, contiguously with the AU. We were in Farron while you were having your planning meetings and then we'd come out to the star parties and we were just really rolling. And then it was March, 2020 and things got sketchy and the club took a little hiatus, but we came back and we've been doing remote uh, Zoom club meetings for a while. We had some super great speakers. When you're remote, it turns out you can tap just about anybody. So I cold called some scientists at uh, JPL. We had someone from Goddard come talk to us. Just about anybody. If you just ask really nice, they'll come to your Zoom. And they came to our Zooms. So the Astronomy Club has been meeting this whole time. And we've just barely gotten back to in-person meetings, uh, outdoor in-person meetings with some telescope observing. We're hoping to meet with you all in March when you have, hopefully, I'm knocking on some wood here, uh, the star party. We'd love to join up for the March star party. We, we're, we're gaining that momentum back and it's going really well. So the Girl Scout Astronomy Club is doing great. And speaking of Girl Scouts, those two little girls you saw would love to sell you some cookies. Get in touch with me if you need any Girl Scout cookies. Got it. Yep. I was just looking for where to get those. <laughs> oh, you just we, hit me up. I've got you covered. Okay. We got we got some early notice, so we loaded up with them. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Chuck and Pat are excellent supporters of the Girl Scouts. Okay. Mores. I need to supervise any purchase that Jerry Wilson makes. <laughs> so just so he doesn't become the champion of all time for buying them <laughs> duly noted before i click the approve button i will check in with you okay <laughs> so okay. uh ron also mentioned that uh the hopeful march speaker was one of the last au meeting speakers but i have the dubious honor of actually having given the last talk at the final in-person right. meeting that we had in March, 2020. That was me. I'm sorry, I forgot, you're right. Uh, it's all my fault. Well, you know, Chad, the whale bones got COVID, I understand during the two year absence and gave it to me. So that's why, forgive us, not, so, doing, not remembering. Uh, if any of you happen to recall, and I would be surprised, the talk that I gave was on Mars 2020 and beyond all the Mars missions. So I thought it'd be kind of fun to just do a little check-in and see what happened with those because a bunch of them had March 2020 launches. As we all know, when you're trying to launch a Mars mission, you have a, a really brief window every two years when you can maximize your fuel by having the shortest distance between Earth and Mars. So that launch window comes along two, every two-ish years. So there was one of those windows in summer of 2020. 
So I thought we could check back in and see how everybody's doing. Obviously, Ooh. Perseverance and Ginny, as the helicopter is sometimes known in Genuity, are doing fine on Mars. Uh, the That helicopter in Genuity is just, I know it's not like giving us the best science we've ever gotten, but in some ways it really is. And it's just so fun to follow it. A couple weeks ago, I made headlines for being the first uh, flight delayed by weather on another world. <laughs> I don't know if any of you saw those headlines. I the that. weather got a little sketchy, so they had to cancel their 19th flight. Mm. But uh, they haven't lost any luggage yet. No. <laughs> not Mars, that they're telling us, Chuck, not that they're telling us. Mars is going through global cooling right now, I understand. So, and we are too, right out here on Earth. Brr. Depending on where you are, for sure. Yeah. So, anyway, the helicopter is doing great. It's landed for now. It's put in over 30 minutes of flight time, which is super impressive. And uh, Perseverance continues to rove around doing his thing. One of the other spacecraft we talked about was the ESA, European Space Agency, joint mission with Roscosmos, the Russian Space Agency, to launch ExoMars with this uh, Roslyn Franklin rover. It did get delayed. It didn't make the launch window. So it's hoping to launch this next, now two years later in September. And that will be a joint orbiter and also rover. Well, the orbiter is already orbiting. It's waiting for the rover to get there. That's why it says 2016 slash 2022. So mm. that one didn't make the COVID cut. But China did. China did manage to launch their Tianwen-1 joint uh, orbiter and rover. And both successfully arrived at Mars. The orbiter entered orbit on February 10th and the rover landed on the 14th they're sending back data most of it not public to us but as far as we know they're doing great on mars oh. been lost, and been lost it, sent in the a selfie. Uh, it has a camera like a it's essentially they, they sent a selfie stick on it and it sent a, a chinese new year selfie back to earth a few days ago last week so i thought we could watch this just real quick selfie video Hey, Fat Choi from Mars. Oh. Let's see. Nope, I want to go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, the UAE's HOPE mission actually did also make their launch window. I was a little nervous about this one. The, the Emirates Mars mission, as it's known, but it also has this little tagline, HOPE, was a really interesting one. They, they wanted to make sure they had this like really diverse and super young um crew and engineers and everybody working on the project and that was a big priority for them and i was worried that an experience might translate into falling into the COVID trap but they did it and they launched and true to their word they're bringing hope to everybody there so super exciting their orbiter is going strong i was real happy about that one the indian Mangalyaan 2, they already have one Mars orbiter. This was a second one that was hopefully going to launch in 2022 and has been delayed. In 2020, they announced a delay till 2022. Now that 2022 is here, it's getting delayed again to 2025. So we'll, we'll keep an eye on that one, but not too close. And of course, someday SpaceX, just a day or two ago, uh, Elon Musk uh, put out a big, you know, it was a sh it wasn't a big tweet. It was a short tweet, but he did announce that next Thursday there'll be some sort of update coming up about the Starship, presumably about when the HLS, the Human Landing System, is gonna do its first orbit of the Moon. We'll see. Uh, that had been first slated for February 2022, then maybe March 2022, but no one's heard anything for a while. 
So, I mean, with that guy, you just never know. Who knows? But his goal is to have a million people on Mars by 2050. We'll see. We'll see about that. <laughs> so that's the update from my previous talk. Um, I, I haven't been monitoring any of the chat or anything, but have there been any questions? I'm happy to field any about the Mars stuff or about any museum. If you have questions about what's going on at the museum, I haven't been on the job long, but happy to take them. Uh, you can count on me at the museum advocating strongly for the AU and making sure you have all the resources that you need. Uh, I Obviously, I'm an AU member and love the AU and want to do everything I can to make sure you are very happy. So don't you ever be shy about coming to me with anything you need. You were one mover and shaker, Chrissy Cook. I just have a couple of quick questions uh, about what you were talking about. That next uh, launch uh, that we're doing together with ESA, is that from Canaveral or South America? Oh, gosh, I think it's launching from Russia. It's a Russia ESA mission. Oh, we're not involved at all. Even if they have invaded. Are Ukraine. they launching? I have to look. Don't quote me on launching from Russia. I think I read that a while ago and they might have changed. What's the policy with the kids astronomical club about adults such as myself or any one of us showing up? Can we monitor, audit the class, sit in the back? <laughs> you mean not... the Girl Scout Astronomy Club? Uh, yeah, your, your kids. It is definitely for Girl Scouts, but you are, I suppose, I mean, we love the AU, the Girl Scout Astronomy Club really, really enjoyed their time uh, when they were with you all and they have seen some of you since and really, um, I, I think they really look up to the AU and the, not just the leadership, but also how warm and embracing you were to them when they were first getting started. I think that really meant a lot to them. So they're big fans. Okay, you did good. No questions about her speech from anybody else? I'm gonna let Jerry. Um, did anyone call in or anything? Or I do not see any chats related to the talk so far. Okay. All right. Well Thank then, you. thanks for having me. Sure. Chrissy. Thank you for doing it, my dear. Excellent talk as always. Yeah, it all comes I'm flooding. Watching. Comes flooding back to me now. Maybe we'll have you back for a whole night in the future. I mean, only if you want to shut down the whole world for a couple of years. Well. Yeah. You, you got it easy, Ryder. That was great. But uh, four, night, four weeks from tonight, can you be on board listening at least or taking part or watching as Briley oh, speaks? I will. I, I Yeah, I'm 100% in. You can count on me being at every AU First Friday meeting. You can count on me being at all the star parties. Wow. Uh, I'm, I'm, in it to, I'm in it to win it. I'm here with you. I'm here for you. Okay, fantastic. You did good. We love it. You're a very good mover and shaker. And a supporter of us. So, Jerry, you want to go now or you want to go at the no, end? I'll, go. I'll do mine. Okay, Jerry Wilson. Now, let me just give you a little uh, prep here, a little uh, introduction in case you guys don't know. This man really is a primo example of somebody that's paid his dues and he's uh, cut his teeth out there on those research and development places along Hollister Avenue ages ago, back in the 70s and 80s. In Santa Barbara Research, Raytheon. Uh, your names and fingerprints are on things still orbiting, perhaps, or, and different probes and voyagers out there. You had something to do with all of them, didn't you, mm -hmm. Mr. President? What's your talk about? My talk is, um, let me let me um, share my screen. Okay. Now... It's not working for a slideshow. Well, what's the border? Oh, so anyway, uh, this this is a uh, an extension of a discussion we briefly did at the Tuesday workshop this week, but I didn't have any slides prepared, and so it was hard to get the ideas across. So I put together some slides, and uh, it'll look real technical, but if you look at it, it's not. It's real simple. So. Um, Modulation transfer function is a, um, oh yeah, this, I always put cartoons in. <laughs> so don't, don't be afraid of the math. Um, there's really not very much except right at the end. So uh, modulation transfer function is a, it's a measure of a system, your telescope, of how well it images and how, how much detail it can show. And so it measures the contrast response of an imaging system at a given spatial frequency 
or for certain size of detail. And this slide tells you what spatial frequency is. It's basically like camera people call it lines per millimeter. Um, and so how faithfully is the image represent is representative of the object. Now I've got a bunch of um, square patterns here, like a picket fence. And this represents different spatial frequencies. So this is this would be a low spatial frequency. So you're looking at big objects, medium sensitivity or spatial frequency gets at finer objects, and then higher gets at even finer objects, and the highest here gets at represents the finest objects that you're looking for, the finest detail in an image. And so it's how well your system re re reproduces these patterns. They pretty much all reproduce the lower and the mediums well, but the, the cr critical thing on telescopes is how, how well they reproduce the higher in terms of contrast between light and dark. So if you have an object like here, this is um, a close-up of Ceres. It's represented by a lens or a telescope, and this one has been um, expertly blurred in Photoshop to show you that it's not a faithful reproduction. There's always some limit to the uh, resolution that, or detail you're going to get in the final image. This represents an object at a certain spatial frequency, and that produces an image of this band that looks roughly like this. The, the, the patterns down here are profiles of those images. So this is if you take a sensor and you go across these bands, they're black, so you get zero irradiance out of it. When you cross the white, you get the highest irradiance that's possible in the object. And then you come to a black band again and white and so on. So this is a 100% contrast and it's regarded as 100% contrast because it's in the object. Now, when you look at something that's challenging the system, you don't get all the black in the black. It blurs the image a little bit. So there's black in the gray in the white and it results in a gray image. If you drag a, a sensor over that, it's dark where there should be a black, it's light where there should be a white, but it's not completely white. This is a lower pattern. You're going about 20% down from the white. Um, and so that's a loss of contrast. So as you get to finer and finer frequencies, finer and finer detail, the contrast fills in in the middle. And so you get uh, more blurry until finally you look at the black and white objects and the entire image is totally gray. That is, you can't even tell where the bands are. That's the resolution limit of your telescope. So, and that's where the modulation transfer function goes to zero. Now, this is, for example, um, a pattern. In order for the what I showed here recently, or just now, is bar patterns. The, in order for it to be a modulation transfer function, and I'll show you why that is, the, the original has to be a sine function, not a black and white bands. So here, the A max is the amplitude maximum, the A min here. And then scanning over this wave pattern, you see that you get where it's one here, that's, that's white and zero is black. The image that you get in your focal plane now as a function of spatial frequency, not position, you see that as the frequency gets higher, the spatial frequency gets higher, the detail gets smaller, you lose contrast in it, the contrast goes away. And at this point, you're at the resolution limit. So the modulation transfer function measures what it is mathematically called a modulation, which is the A max value minus the A min value, A max minus A, oh, it didn't take when I corrected that. That should be a lowercase m. And A max plus A min. So that gives you this function. And so that at each frequency, you get a modulation. And that looks like this. So this is a modulation transfer function curve going from the coarsest data to the finest data and then disappearing at the resolution limit. Um, let's see. So this, these are modulation transfer functions of selected cases. And this one, the first one up here at the top is of a diffraction limited perfect circular and rectangular aperture. 
So this is the modulation function of a, a perfect lens. The lens is diffraction limited, it's rectangular. It decreases linearly like this and comes down to its resolution limit. So um, at zero, so it goes from one to zero. The perfect circular aperture, which we're more used to in our telescopes, but diffraction limited, doesn't produce as, per, as well a relationship or a well of a transfer of the contrast, a representation of the contrast of the object. It's slightly poorer here, but then it, it picks up speed at the end and gets down to the same cutoff for the same aperture. The reason it goes down above the rectangular one is that the rectangular, the rectangular one has the same width across. This is a one-dimensional scan. The circular one, as you go across cords of the circle, um, it has less uh, input to the diffraction limit. So you get a slightly degraded response from that. But we still don't make telescopes rectangular because we look at things in two dimension and we're only looking at one here. So the, um, and this, this down here at the bottom is a four inch F10 mirror with and without central obscuration. So this is a Newtonian telescope mirror all by itself on the test bed, giving its, uh, its uh, circular modulation transfer function. And this is the curve you have with a central obscuration. So you lose a lot of detail at the larger sizes, but you pick up, you come back up to the a faithful representation and even exceed it to a bit at the finer detail. So these things are actually very good with a small center obscuration for looking at planets. This is my ex cat, Eddie. He was always my buddy when I did these things at the telescope and at the uh, computer. <laughs> so, the caveats are, um, even though square waves are, have been used for the object in this talk, it's only because they're easier to draw and they're technically incorrect. If you look at a square wave, you're not actually measuring MTF, even though some uh, companies actually do use that statement, but it gives you a um, false impression of how good their images are. In order for the resulting metric to be uh, a true MTF, the object must be a sine wave. And the reason for that is because sines and cosines form a complete set of basis vectors. And what I mean by basis vectors, it's just like the X, Y, and Z um, axes in a coordinate space. You can represent any axis, any vector in a, in a co coordinate space, in Cartesian space, by giving its X, Y, and Z component. So that there's nothing else. There's nothing X, Y, and Z does it. Uh, sines and cosines form a complete set of basis vectors for any um, um, uh, piecewise continuous function. So they're the function analogy of a vector in vector space. And you can approximate and you can uh, any function by a set of sines and cosines provided it's continuous. And you're willing to uh, run it out to a lot of number of places in the, in the summation. Now the reason and a way to look at that is square waves do not form a complete set like sines and cosines do. There is a square wave, but there's no co-square wave to complete it out. So there are things you can't really represent well. It was big effort back in the 50s and 60s to try and make sines and make uh, square waves into a complete set. Um, and it was called Z transform theory, but it's never uh, caught on. Um, also, I showed you bands of square waves that had like four square waves in it. But technically, the object, in order for this to be MTF, the object has to go from minus infinity to plus infinity. Um, but for us in the optical bench, it only has to go to the edge of the field of view. So you don't have to paint walls and down the hall and all that stuff to get it in there. You can't see it. Jim, Jim Williams has a question that he does. Two questions. He says, uh, one, number one, is, is the MTF a function that's normally reported when buying a telescope? And number two is, uh, what number should you look for? Uh, well, good question. You want to look for its uh, numbers. You want to look for a plot. And the plot should be as close to these as you can get. Uh, this is what you will get for a typical Newtonian or Cassegrainian system. 
Uh, you want to make sure you want to you get something if they go bad, if they're not good, uh, the curve will fall very quickly down here and then it will run along this axis to the diffraction limit because uh, it includes everything, aberrations and stuff. They don't normally put this out because most people don't understand MTF, even though it's quite simple. <clears throat> and so you can look it up and find things where they talk about it, um, especially and the reason it came up for us on Tuesday night was that another member of the club, uh, Mike Chipnick, is working through and bringing us along with him on how to measure the quality of your mirror using a bath interferometer. And the bath interferometer data produces modulation transfer function as an output. And so we were discussing what that might mean. And that, hence we got to this talk. Uh, most people don't use this in uh, uh, th their normal use of telescopes as a user. And what was the other question? It was what number you should look for. Oh, you, you look for that curve. You look for the graph. Yeah. yeah, look for the graph. So um, anyway, down here to the bottom, this is a Fourier transform or Fourier series that is fitting itself to a through some mathematics that you did already a couple pages of math to get these numbers this way and get these relationships that fits to a square wave. And what this large Greek letter, the sigma means it's the summation uh, of terms from one to infinity of this term repeated again and again with n increased by that number. The first term would be n equal one. So it would be uh, sine pi x over L, where L is the width of the linear plateau. And you notice that only um, odd numbers are down here in the sum that will fall out. All the cosine terms drop away and the even sine terms drop away. And you get the simple thing we see on the right. The red line here is the first term all by itself of that approximation. And that looks just like a sine curve because it is, it's a sine wave. As you add in the second term, which is act actually uses n equal three, you get this yellow term when it's summed with the first term. So as you see, it's already starting to take on the characteristics of a flat top and a steep edge and a flat bottom. The next term, which is the fifth term, you get this green line when it's summed with the first two terms. And that gives this curve and finally, the purple at uh, n equals seven, when it's summed with the first three terms, uh, that shows the purple and you're starting to flatten out up here. Depending on how patient you are and how many of these terms you want to run out here with a calculator, it's easier to do it with a computer, it's faster. But that will produce something that is completely indistinguishable from a square wave as a presentation of the ability of sines and cosines to reproduce other functions except that right at the corner where it's discontinuous, there's usually a little overshoot called the Gibbs phenomena. But that was because it violated, that point violates the uh, continuity rule. So that's my talk. <laughs> so you were the and, dominating and, force on Tuesday night's workshop for telescope lovers, Mr. President. With that, what's that? You, you were the main man with this topic on Tuesday night. Just, yeah, but I don't think a lot of people got it. So I'll, I'll show these next Tuesday. Well, like Einstein said at the bar, so exactly what about MTFs and square waves? Don't you understand, punk? Right. <laughs> and Jim, by the way, says he got it, and thanks. Okay, good. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. President. It's, maybe we can continue this discussion if you're still interested Monday morning on our Astro Hour. Okay. Ron, Ron yes. I have a, a question for Chrissy that was uh, given by uh, Duff Kennedy. And he wanted to know uh, why do you have to launch to Mars at a specific time in relation to your destination to save fuel? I thought the fuel went to get a ship out into space and from there it just coasted. Why do you need more fuel even when you're out past the Earth's gravity? Aha, uh -huh. Chrissy? Oh, I think you're muted. I'm muted, Chrissy. <laughs> Yeah, I hit the space bar, but it didn't unmute me. Okay. Uh, that's a really great question. So um, it's you're right. The the it's it's more time saving than fuel saving. We get there faster, but also, um, well, um, that's yeah. The the fuel is essentially uh, how you need fuel to launch away from Earth. You got to get uh, out of 
our, well, you're not ever going to technically escape our gravitational pull because we have mass and so, but anyway, uh, yeah, it is, uh, the launch window is mostly about that time because you get there in seven months, but also, um, I can add a comment if you yeah, would like. Yeah, please, jump right the, in. The uh, orbit that you're trying to get into, as you point out, is a coasting orbit to Mars. Uh, getting into other orbits, it's a lot more fuel. And you, in some of those orbits, you won't ever catch up to Mars. You have to burn the rocket on the way, you lose the coasting orbit, and you have to burn to catch up to Mars. So it's, it's, uh, that's the most efficient orbit, as you point out is the coasting orbit. It's also the fastest orbit. Yeah, Thank I'm you. trying to load an image right now really quick from Google since we are, you know, we can do this. Let me just quickly show you, I'll share my screen. Um, <laughs> give you a quick diagram, because we can. There we go. You'll see Earth at launch, Earth at arrival, Mars at arrival. So you want to hit this launch window time because if they're further apart, um, again, entering into that orbit, just like Jerry said, is going to be trickier. So that is why it is. Let's see. We're not seeing the screen, Chrissy. There we go. I just noticed. Uh -huh. it's been, I taught on Zoom exclusively for months, and I'm now a little rusty, and it's frustrating to me. This is a really good refresher. There we go. Are we looking at the screen now? We see it. Yeah. So there we go. My uh -huh. mouse is circling. Here's Earth at launch, and it keeps going around. Of course, uh, the it's almost a two to one ratio of Earth's orbit and Mars orbit. So they'll be pretty near each other. You launch, you get right there so that it enters into that orbit, as Jerry says, to save yourself the hassle. You don't want to fly past it. You don't want to have to break too hard because of course, we're not, sometimes you're trying to orbit Mars, but if we're trying to land on Mars, then you actually have to slow down and that's a whole thing. I'm sure we remember the sequence of just like putting ourselves in a million airbags to land those rovers. And then we were, the rocks had slowed down and we're parachuting in and there's all those, the foils on the front, all the air shields, all the stuff. Hmm. I hope that answered the question adequately. Well, perseverance and ingenuity stuff is being overshadowed these days by the James Webb yeah but we talk about it all on monday mornings and chrissy anytime you want to join us i love you um we'll talk about it later but it also um let me stop my screen share it's a little tricky i i also have another job um and i start that job at 12 o'clock so oh well, that's a cheap excuse we'll PM or AM. what's that PM or AM. <laughs> Uh, I mean, technically, it's 12 p.m., but I, you might find me doing either job at any hour. I was sending oh, okay. an email to the planetarium people last night at like 11.45 p.m., <laughs> and I've, I had my other jobs at a school, so all those teachers, they love to send emails at like 5.30 in the morning. I do not understand it. Mm -hmm. I am well-suited to a school job that starts at noon. We'll just say that. Just okay. get ready by 11 and join us for a few minutes, then race out the door. We got a special guy for the ending here. I haven't met uh, Daniel uh, uh, Gondinas and his orchestra. Dan is on the screen. Uh, part of his talk, I want to find out about you. I, I think he's in the club. He's been patiently waiting through a, a lot of this, and uh, we haven't talked about him, but he reminds me a little bit about Adrian Lopez, who was my predecessor as vice president, who got yanked down to Caltech on a... Um, uh, what is he on a scholarship down there for free? And uh, he's awesome. And then, so this young man is out at UCSB. Daniel Goninas has been in the club. I'm going to let him tell us all about what he's doing, what he plans to do, uh, how close is he to getting a doctorate in, I assume, astronomy could be your major. Daniel, uh, your talk is called, uh, what is it, Cosmic Evolution? Mysteries of Cosmic Evolution. Ladies and gentlemen, Daniel Godinas, UCSB. Yes. Thank you, Ron. And actually, I just started my PhD this uh, this past fall, and I really wanted to be at UCSB, but they didn't accept me. So I'm actually in New Mexico. Oh. I'm, with, I'm with the PhD program at the New Mexico State University. Okay. I are better there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm happy here. This is actually my first semester officially. Since last semester was all on Zoom, 
And now finally they opened everything back up um, officially anyway. So I want to start off by just well, uh, saying, saying hi to all of you. The only people I remember that are on this call are, of course, Chuck and Pat. Uh, but there are so many folks that I, I joined SBA, the, the SBAU when I was maybe 12 or 13. I'm almost 26 now. So I can't remember the last time I was even at a meeting, but I'm, I always get the newsletter. So when I saw this opportunity, I thought this is just perfect. Share what I'm doing, share what I hope to do. And well, here, let me, let me just jump right into it. Let me share my screen here and let me just play this. Mm. So yeah, so I titled this The Mysteries of Cosmic Evolution. But before I get into these mysteries that I've been pondering, let me just show what, what, I have, what I have done in the past. So when I was in Santa Barbara, I had the chance to work with the folks over at the Las Cumbres Observatory. So I, they gave me, when I was doing my undergraduate studies uh, in physics, they gave me the opportunity to do an internship. And I was doing an internship there for overall three summers, but we were working year round. And what I was tasked to do is, yeah, I was working with the microlensing team, gravitational microlensing. So the idea is very simple. You know, can we can we detect gravitational microlensing in a wide field survey? You can imagine maybe every night you get 10 million stars and you can task a computer to tell you whether or not a star is undergoing gravitational microlensing. Reason being, if you do detect these early enough, you, you can point additional telescopes to, to observe the source. And if there are planetary anomalies, then you would be able to detect them. And in this picture that I have here, this was a true microlensing event at the top, you can see there are a couple of gaps, which is a big problem because planetary anomalies can be as short as 10 hours. So if you don't have a telescope pointing at it and a planetary anomaly comes and goes, you're never gonna see that again. So what I did is I developed a program called LIA, which applies a machine learning method to essentially you get the time series data, this light curve, and it computes over a hundred statistical metrics. And then it feeds it through a random forest machine learning engine and then the outputs what the probability prediction is. So what I did here at the bottom is I fed this light curve one at a time. In other words, even though we got this light curve at the end, we, we were, were pretending what if we were observing this light curve in real time? At what point would our engine have detected it? And this detection occurs here in the bottom graph anytime the green, which is the microlensing detection probability, is higher than all the rest. So you can see in this particular example, our our machine learning algorithm can, de can detect the microlensing event prior to the peak. So we have this, it's working, and it's actually part of the, uh, the alert broker that LSST is going to be using. I guess it's not called LSST anymore, it's called Rubin Observatory, uh, but it's, it's, it's online and there are a couple other brokers that are using it. I know CTF as well. Um, so it's, this is what, the, the first project that I did, and I, I credit this a lot to, you know, it gave me research opportunity, it gave me a lot of experience, made me good at coding, and now I'm able to apply this in my PhD study. So when I started last fall, the first thing that I did is I joined the extra galactic team. And my advisor, she's studying what we call Lyman Alpha Nebula or Lyman Alpha blobs. These are blobs that are galaxy nurseries. And they're the biggest objects in the universe. And we don't really know too much about them because they're very rare. We think that this is how all galaxies were born. All galaxies came from a Lyman alpha blob. And we call them Lyman alpha blobs because the way we detect them is through the uh, Lyman alpha uh, emission line. And the big problem is that these are very rare and very hard to find. You can imagine you have, you know, uh, like a deep field survey, you might have 3 million galaxies. And out of those 3 million, maybe five blobs are present. So I said, okay, so, so the idea is, can we detect these blobs you see machine learning? And the answer is yes. In fact, I, we, I, I, the, the program that I wrote is called Pybia and it's up on GitHub, it's all open source and we're actually about to send out this paper. And the way that it works is it takes an image, 50 by 50 pixels, and it, it, we use a convolutional neural network. So essentially what we did is we have a bunch of blobs that we have confirmed are true blobs. We augmented these blobs each, I think a hundred times. So our total training set of blobs is about almost 100,000, even though in reality, it's only a couple hundred. And yeah, we essentially just ran this neural network, we trained it with existing blobs, and we confirmed that indeed it works in the false positive rate is about 4%. So the term, the data set that we tested with was about 3 million galaxies. So 4% might not seem like a lot, but 4% of 3 million, 4% false positives of 3 million, you can imagine that's a lot of false positives that someone like me has to inspect by eye. So the, there are a couple of cutoffs that, you know, that, that we put in place. So I didn't actually have to inspect 4%, but the actual neural network itself, that's what we found. It's 
It can virtually detect every single blob. The only downside being this 4% false positive. Rate. Can, I, can I ask a question of you? Please. Yeah. Um, are you trying to predict when a lensing is going to occur before the event? Or are you trying to predict when a lensing is starting? Yeah, so in principle, the earlier, the better. Right. So okay. we, could have, we, we found that in practice, we couldn't do anything with less than five points. It was more or less random. Uh, but yeah, we would want to detect it as early as possible. And another problem is there are a lot of variable stars that look like microlensing. So we followed up when I was with the folks at the Los Cumbres Observatory, we followed up maybe three or four variable stars. So, you know, we just didn't have an, a good baseline for these were just discovered. They look like microlensing, could have been microlensing, but then they actually weren't. So this happens, it's, it's a risk. Now this is, this is microlensing by stars? Yeah, so this is microlensing. So the actual, uh, the lensing star, the star in the middle, you cannot see it. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Is that Question. gravitational lensing we're talking about? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Micro Question, uh, 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 you're using Python? This is all Python. This is, okay. I believe, the, the random forest we implemented with the Keras API. Very powerful. Hmm. Oh. And same same with this, this convolution neural network. Again, I, I pushed the code all, all, all online. It's all on GitHub, and it's all done with Python. So I got to credit all the engineers who came together and made this open source so someone like me mm -hmm. could you know, engineering a machine learning engine to detect I'm an awful blob using images would be a PhD all, all on its own. I was able to do it in about two months just because they made it so easy to load these modules, train your data, create the infrastructure, and then run a quick test. So, so this is done. This project is pretty much finished. We're just about to publish this paper. So I picked up another project while I finalized this one with, uh, with the planetary advisor. So this, this fella, he, the project that he has in mind is he said, okay, we have there's a big problem when, we, when it comes to protoplanetary observations. You say, you look at these protoplanetary disks, you observe the light coming out of these protoplanetary disks, but he says there's missing lights, which corresponds to missing mass. So the question is, where is this mass that we don't see? Because the mass that we detect, is not enough mass to actually create the planets that we observe. So we call this the missing mass problem. His idea is, it's pretty simple. He says, it's, be, it's all because of dust. He's saying when planetary formation occurs, and we're doing this in the context of streaming instability, which means just rocks come together and then they uh -huh. form here uh, about meteor size or, or asteroid size, planetesimals, and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. But his idea is that, well, when you're creating planets, there are these optically thick pockets that are remnants of it. And these optically thick pockets actually trap a lot of the light, absorb a lot of the lights. So when we're looking at these protoplanetary disks, and we're missing light, it's not that the light is not there. He thinks that actually the light is there. It's just these optically thick pockets that are hiding it from us. So we, it's a two-step process. We actually already finished the first step. We simulated what the, the planetary formation looks like. Now we're gonna run a radiative transfer code. We're gonna shoot a lot of photons. And then we're gonna see, we know what the mass is because we're controlling the simulation. Then at the step three is we calculate how much light made it through. And the idea is that, well, in our simulations, there are going to be these optically thick pockets that are going to absorb a lot of light. So the light that comes through at the end and our end is not going to be enough to explain the mass. And that should maybe solve this missing mass problem. So we hope to finish, hopefully by the summer, we're making very good progress. But the one thing I did want to share with all of you, which I didn't know is that, well, when, when we're studying planetary formation, we actually start with uh, the loss of hydrodynamics because when planets are forming, this gas and dust, this is, this is a side view. You were a star, very young star, planets form within about 3 million years. This is what your side view will look like. So the gas and the dust that forms these planets, actually, they like to resonate. There, there is a particular wavelength that they like to flow at. And this is what we're looking at here. I've, you, you see a couple of planetesimals, these very dense spots here. But I was just blown away to think that, indeed, fluid dynamics is what we use to run these simulations. Planets, when they're forming, they like to flow up particular wavelengths. I just think it's fascinating. And finally, one side project that I'm gonna pick up as soon as the big eight meter telescope comes online is it, some folks at, at Caltech, they have proven that within, they, it's pretty much accepted. I think that there is another planet out there, planet nine, planet X, call it whatever. We know it's there, they, these, these folks at Caltech, they even, they're even telling us where it is. It's somewhere here, plus or minus a couple of degrees. It's impossible to find it, of course, but actually it should be dim enough if they think it's five to turn 10 Earth masses, very icy world. 
the big telescope, the Amir telescope that's coming online, hopefully next year, will be able to detect it. So within the next decade, uh, quite confident that we are going to have another planet. So a lot of papers are being published, you know, trying to tackle the idea of, well, how can we detect this planet? And this particular paper, it, it outlines a very simple uh, procedure. First, you detect the moving object, which I could imagine like an asteroid, for example, you check any x-ray signatures. If you find a moving object and it has an x-ray signature, it's probably a planet. So what I'm working on is, can we, can I create an algorithm to detect moving objects? Um, I think the answer is yes, people have done it. Probably the only problem is I'm going to be following up a lot of asteroids, which I think will be cool anyway. Wow. Do, do the two Voyagers uh, still take pictures? Have they gone past where this might be, or could they mistaken to get a shot of it? <laughs> Good question. I don't think, since this planet is so far away, which is one of the reasons we can't see it. I think they think the apparent magnitude might be something like 28 or 29, um, but I couldn't That's tell you. All right. Yeah, it's very dim. But even then, they have run their calculations and they said this big telescope coming online is going to detect it. So the big problem is there are billions, billions of stars, billions, billions of objects that are going to be, come, be coming out as data. No one's ever going to look at all that data. So again, I would create some sort of machine learning engine that can Pass, parse through all this data and then just output candidates every day. Okay, you know, here's a hundred moving objects that I found. It would be up to me to check if there are any X-ray signatures. But anyway, so the procedure is simple. Um, I asked my friend, is it possible that I can detect this planet? And he said, well, you either need better computers from, you know, from like the Caltech teams, which I don't have, or you need a better algorithm, which hopefully I will have. Uh, but I haven't started this, this algorithm yet, but I, I've been thinking about it a lot and I think I know you know, how, how to get it going. Um, anyway, so, so I have some time. You're going to wipe out a poten potential Zooniverse uh, outsourcing. <laughs> uh, well, uh, Daniel, the uh, new computer telescope, telescope you're saying that's going up online, is that the James Webb? I didn't understand you. You're Not the James Webb. This is the one being built in Chile. It was called the LSST. Um, oh. was called, I think Ruben C. Observatory. They renamed it recently. But I sh it should have been online already, but there's always these hiccups. So hopefully by the end of this year, maybe by next year, it'll be online. But yeah, this is the one, the, the eight meter telescope in Chile. How about the university in New Mexico you're going to? Do they have a pretty nice observatory and good scene at night? They, they have definitely, the skies are nice. The big telescope that we are partnered with is APO, the 3.5 meter. Uh, so I do have access to it to some extent. I can put in... Uh, some proposals and they always get approved because the director is a, a professor here, uh, but nothing bigger than 3.5 meters. The only other one is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which they're a big part of. So I have access to all that data, uh, but I don't know that I can really put in any observations in the queue. Uh, yeah, no, nothing. So I'm really looking forward to this eight meter. As soon as it comes out, data is coming online and I'm going to put this to, to good use. And a lot of papers should be should be coming out in the next couple of years. So anyway, so these are my official projects, astronomy projects that I'm focused on. But to go back to this topic of the mysteries of cosmic evolution, I wanna start off by sharing what a, a professor of mine is working on. Uh, he's not my advisor, but in 2020, he published a paper in which he investigated this weird animal called the slime mold, which kind of scavenges the bottoms of the rainforest. It's a single cell organism that comes together and together, it acts as a single organism and it scavenges for food. So the, you can see it kind of builds these transport networks. So what this professor did is he said, well, what if, um, so, so his inspiration was that a scientist found that it is a Petri dish of it. They, they, his, this is a map of Tokyo and the slime mold here in the zero hour is right at the beginnings, right where Tokyo is. And these little white spots are different cities around Tokyo. So the slime mold really likes oats so that's what you're looking at here. These are different oats, which represent different cities around Tokyo. And they let the slime mold grow. And you can see it kind of grows in a spherical manner with all these connections. But as soon as, as it's finding more and more food, it stabilizes the connections, it hardens the connections. And at the end, in about 26 hours, you have what more or less mimics the Tokyo subway system. So the idea is that this slime mold, as it's looking for food, it is so efficient that it's at times even more efficient than the Tokyo engineers. So somehow the slime mold is very efficient at finding food and creating these transport networks. So my professor said, well, you know, what can we do with this in the context of astronomy? So he uh, studies galaxies. So he looked at the cosmic web. 
So this is the cosmic web, which is, I like to think of as the, you know, these different tunnels of gas that connect all the galaxies. And the reason that the cosmic web looks like a web is because of the orientation of, the, of dark matter. You can think of the dark matter kind of ch channeling these, ch these channels, or in other words, the, you can think of the dark matter as the skeleton of the universe and the cosmic web just kind of follows this orientation of the dark matter. And then what we have here is just every galaxy in the universe is seemingly connected and there's gas that's coming from one into the other, which is very important because this is how we get star formation. So what this professor did is he said, wow, what you're looking at here, it's not actually the cosmic web, this is the slime mold. He had data for about 40,000 galaxies. So he knew the position, he knew the mass, very similar to what these scientists were doing, but with the, the Tokyo subway system. So all he did was he asked this program that he's been working with with collaborators to simulate what a slime mold will do when it finds food. So he put these 40,000 points in three dimensional space. He let the slime mold grow. And indeed at the end, on the left, these are the galaxies, real galaxies, real data. And on the right, this is what the slime mold came up with as soon as they finished the connections. And indeed when he ran this analysis, he said that this very much mimics the cosmic web. So why is it that the cosmic web is so efficient? Well, it must be a coincidence. Why is the dark matter oriented the way that it is? All I can say it's a coincidence, but seemingly it's acting as a way to transport food. And well, that's the way that I like to think of it is without the cosmic web being the way that it is, galaxies wouldn't be able to undergo star formation. That's in a way it's how galaxies share resources. They share this cold molecular hydrogen that is needed to get stars going, to get planets going, et cetera. And it just so happens that the way that this transport network works is the way that a slime mold will look for food. Huh. That, that, that diagram on the sky behind these two pictures reminds me, if you can take the pictures away, it looks like the side of the human brain. It's like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's actually this, this picture here. Well, yeah, that looks like the brain, and it leads me to think that this whole thing, the slime mole and the uh, uh, cosmic web, if you will, reminds me of synapses and axioms. Okay. So, so that's, that's actually what I'm working on now. It's okay. He made this, this, this slime mold program to simulate a slime mold. It's called Polyform. It's on GitHub, open source, very easy to use. All you need is XYZ position of, of objects and the mass, and then uh, the slime mold is going to grow. So I thought, okay. Um, surely, what if you can rep recreate a brain? You can think of the neurons as the mass, the neurons as the food that the slime mold uses. Is it possible that we can recreate the synapses that are in a human brain? I talked to my to my friend who was a PhD in neuroscience, and he said probably not possible because the human brain has so many neurons. There's no way you're ever going to get that data. But he said that recently that we did get data over warm. Uh, so that's exactly what I was going at is, okay, if I can't model the human brain, let me go a couple steps below and think of a simpler organism. So this worm that I'm working with only has about 200 neurons. And what's fascinating is the last year, for the first time, scientists were able to color code these neurons with, I can't remember what procedure they used. They're actually selling this now, but this is a, uh, this is a worm and these colors, these color dots are the neurons that you see at the bottom. And it's about 200 or so neurons. And what's nice about this is this is all data that they released when they published their paper last year. So I have the position of every neuron at the XYZ position. I'm pretty sure I have the mass. I've been trying to work that one out, but that's all I need. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to put in the slime mold, right? You have to put, you have to start the slime mold growth kind of where everything is concentrated. So you can see in this particular picture, I put an outline of a worm. The head has, is where most of the neurons are concentrated, but it doesn't have a normal brain like you and I have. The neurons are kind of spread out all, all across its body, which is fine because in, in this code that allows the slime mold to grow, you can, it doesn't have to be a sphere or a square. You can put a rectangular boundary. So I can put a rectangular boundary, which is the body of the worm. The neurons are the foods of the slime mold. And then I just put the slime mold in the middle you know, where everything is concentrated and I'll let it grow. Mm -hmm. And then I'll be able to compare with what the synapses actually look like. And my guess is that, well, if the cosmic web is as efficient as it should be as, or as efficient as possible, then surely brains themselves must be also, you know, as efficient as possible. So I'm very confident that as soon as I finish this, I'll be able to say that indeed this, you can recreate, you know, the, the structure of synapses using the slime mold. So mm -hmm. this is something I've been working on. I hope to finish it maybe, Within a month or two. Okay. 
astronomy spilling over into biology in, in New Mexico there. I got a lot of dark matter in my brain instead of gray. Any questions of this gentleman? Folks? Uh, nothing oh, nothing from I can see. Well, Very interesting. Well, too. Fascinating. Well done. Finish off here, I, just have, I talked to a biology professor on Tuesday because I, I showed him all, all of this, the slime mold, the cosmic web, and he said he, he's actually specializes in plants. And he told me that indeed, some, something weird happens when plants are growing near each other that their roots share nutrients. So when one plant is growing, one of the other plants are gonna sh sh throw more nutrients away. And then when it's their time to grow, those nutrients will come back. So he said, there are two schools of thoughts. Those biologists think that it's competition, that when you know the one plant needs nutrients, it's just gonna steal the nutrients from others. And the second school of thought is that it's all one coherent uniform network, that indeed it's not competition, it's, you're actually able to know when other when some plants should get nutrients over others. So his idea is, well, let's take the plants to be the mass and you'll let the slime mold grow. And I, he thinks that indeed when we finish creating this root network, it's going to more or less mimic what the slime mold will do. So I, I definitely want to apply this to biology. Um, but it, this is something that I, I guess what, what I wanted to, to get at here was that every time we study the universe, we're really studying ourselves down here on Earth, not only you know, could we apply this technique to psychology, to human behavior? I'm, most certainly, I think that's what we find the universe so fascinating that when we study and we look back, you know, redshifts of two or three, 10, 12 billion years ago, we're looking back at ourselves and everything that we should, everything that we do see, the patterns and the structures up in the sky, I think we should be able to see them down here on Earth. Okay. And so, so that's my motivation for, you know, being open-minded about uh, you know, these, these discoveries and how can we uh, you know, do interdisciplinary approaches and well, I just want to finish by this quote of Einstein, which I think is kind of encapsulates everything that indeed, when we look up above, we're really studying ourselves and we should, you know, if we're observant enough, be able to make these connections, uh, you know, these global connections to our local lives. So anyway, so I'm excited about all these projects. I think maybe I'm tackling a little bit too much, but I don't have to work. This is my work. So hopefully by the end of this year, I'll be able to show you all an update and I got a couple papers in the work. Hopefully those get through by this summer and anything I come up with, you know, I'll, I'm always going to be sharing it with you guys. So anyway, if you, anybody has any questions, I'm, I'm happy to take them. Jim yeah. Williams says, yeah. absolutely amazing. Good stuff. Well yeah, very, very interesting. Yeah. If you come to town, Daniel, uh, you can speak to us again if it's early in the month. Uh, you, do you, are you based here out of Santa Barbara and just in New Mexico temporarily? Oh, I was, but I just made the move a couple months ago. It's, oh. it's better for me to be here with my colleagues. Okay. Um, yeah, it was hard to leave. And you started as a young prodigy, just like Adrian, our last vice president, who was 17. Good show. Good stuff. I think we all can we yeah. apply. <laughs> That's been a good meeting, Mr. President. You want to mm -hmm. wrap it up? Yeah, I think so. We're just uh, one hour for speakers is just about right. You timed it very well, Mr. VP. <laughs> well, thank you, my friend. So um, find someone else for the next meeting. We'll have it on the first Friday in uh, March. Are we going to have a business meeting this month? We'll next have month? a business meeting a week from tomorrow. For the business folks. Okay. Yeah. Not to talk about and and uh, Jerry, he also, he already has Briley. Oh, okay. Next month. Okay. Yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna convene again like we are right now, same group. And well, yes, at least a core group like this. Okay. And uh, Chrissy Cook, thank you very much for being on board. Uh, uh, congratulations <laughs> on the yeah. on the girls uh, Girl Scout troop, and uh, get your orders in for the cookies. Okay. <laughs> You'll be we have, we have two me. comments. Uh, Sonia Rodriguez says, "Thank you so much, Daniel." Yeah. And uh, Jim Williams says, this is like an old Star Trek episode. Beat <laughs> <laughs> me up, Scotty. Yeah. <laughs> Fascinating stuff. Well, Monday morning, we'll be talking. and You can join on uh, YouTube and watch us. Okay. Six of us. Thank you. So this, this meeting is adjourned at 832. 33. <laughs> Got it. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.